Um, okay, so I'm Katya. I uh, work for a company called Inclusive UX that I run with my business partner, Lisa. Um, who here went to UX Australia this year? Who here saw me present at UX Australia? Laugh at my jokes. Uh, <laughs> don't give away my questions. <laughs> Okay, that's great. So most of you haven't actually seen this presentation. I gave this one at UX Australia a couple of months ago. Um, I'm really, I'm really excited to be able to follow on from Jason's um, presentation as well because this is such a terrific and enormous um, subject that I think it definitely warrants two talks. Okay, so I'm talking about universal design for touch devices, and this is a huge topic. So I'm just going to talk for about 20 minutes, and I'm going to try and do four things in 20 minutes rather than cover everything. So number one, what do we actually mean when we're talking about universal design? Why are you laughing at me, Lisa Riley? I'll kick you out. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite evil. Um, two, the people who are using touch devices are as diverse as all of the devices themselves. Um, three, there's actually easy things that you can do as interaction designers and developers um, to create a touch experience that's universal and inclusive. And four, I'm going to talk about some of the new things that are coming up in the future which are um, exciting and going to be um, challenging to design for. Um, given this is a 20 minute talk, question time's probably going to be a bit limited if we want to speed network afterwards. This is my Twitter handle, tweet me to ask questions if we don't get time for all of them today. Okay, so thing number one, universal design. Let's go to Wikipedia for our definition then. Universal design is the concept of designing all products and the built environment to be as aesthetic and usable to the greatest extent possible by everyone, regardless of their age, ability, or status in life. That's a really big, long sentence. So I think, what, what does it actually mean in real life? I'll give you an example, one of my favorite examples of universal design. This is the key drop. Um, this is uh, something that was designed in response to needs in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where mostly women were having to carry these kind of 15 litre um, drums of water on their head from the nearest potable water source. Um, it caused some spinal injuries, you know, neck injuries, uh, head injuries, and it often fell to, fell to the women and the children to do these chores. So what Q Drum did was actually reinvented the wheel and created this 50 litre drum with a longitudinal shaft. And all you have to do is put a rope through it and a child can pull it along, which relieved so much um, stress on families and it's just you know, an example of design changing the world. Um, this design solution is flexible, it's simple, it's intuitive, you pick up the rope and you use it. It's equitable and it's very low effort. Now I'm using those words for a reason because there's such a thing as seven universal design principles and let's pick them apart very quickly. So this is a little bit different. Universal design is different to barrier-free design or accessible design. It's much wider than that. Um, and it's also relevant to all kinds of design. It's not just digital. So the example that I gave you was obviously not a digital design. It was a physical design. Um, but it still comes in under this, under this concept of universal design. Um, so equitable use, this relates directly to social equality. And this can be um, you know, the right to vote, uh, the right to education, um, the access to health services, social security. Flexibility in use is not about yoga poses or anything like that, but it's about being able, your design, being able to adapt to external uncertainties and still deliver its desired value. Um, simple and intuitive, that's uh, kind of what it says on the tin. And every you know, good designer knows that we have to make stuff that's simple and intuitive. Um, uh, but it's, the point of it is, is that the people who are using your design don't have to go through a long um, a process to learn how to use it. Perceptible information, so we all perceive with our senses. So we perceive with sight, sound, um, we perceive with touch. We also perceive with things like pain and balance and you know, other things that are not necessarily your five senses. Um, but the idea of perceptible information is that regardless of whatever sensory deprivation you may have, you can still get at the information that's being provided for you by the design. Tolerance for error. Everybody makes mistakes. So designing something that has tolerance for error allows people to make mistakes, allows people to recover from mistakes. And if you're designing for diverse audiences, such as you know, children, children make mistakes all the time and hold things upside down in the wrong way. 
So um, this is a really good one for kids and also a cognitive impairment. Low physical effort. Now I know the gestural stuff from Minority Report looks really cool, but imagine if that was your interface that you had to work with every single day. By the end of the day, you would be completely inactive and unable to function as a human being. You wouldn't need the gym. You wouldn't need the gym, but seriously, man, would you? Would you do it? <laughs> Um, and the size and space uh, for approaching use, that's more around um, built environments. So if you have a design that's being used by somebody who's in a wheelchair, there's enough size, uh, there's enough space around it for them to be able to access the design. Okay, so that's thing number one, done. Universal design, you all get it now. Okay, there is nothing that you can do on the iPhone or iPad that I can't do. Who said it, anyone? Who didn't go and talk? It's not Bill Gates. Nice, you know. It's, it's very jobs in, but it's not. It is a Steve. It's Stevie Wonder. That's Stevie Wonder stopped in the middle of one of his gigs, and he made there was kind of an ode to jobs, and um, that was one of the statements that he made that there's nothing that you can't do as a sighted individual on an iPad or an iPhone that I can't achieve myself. So we know Stevie Wonder. He can't see. Um, people who use mobile devices can be hearing impaired, they can be visually impaired, they might have cognitive impairments like dyslexia. Um, and the, the other thing that we need to keep, uh, keep in mind is this emerging market. It's the Australian population who are ageing at a rate of knots that's extraordinary. More people are getting old than are getting born. So respected elders, that's my you know, PC term for people <laughs> between 65 and 84, they're expected to more than double between now and 2050. That is a huge number. And really venerated elders, people 85 and older, are expected to more than quadruple. And this is our target market. <laughs> um, and older people often have a lot of disabilities that they're trying to deal with. They have low vision um, from age-related macular degeneration, perhaps palsies because they're just getting older, and dementia because they're getting older. Um, and when they walk into a mobile phone store, you know, like Telstra or somebody, the device that's being put in front of them when they're churning their Nokia brick is a Samsung Galaxy or an iPhone or a smartphone, and they'll be told this is what you need. So this is an emer this is definitely an emerging market that you need to um, keep in mind. Um, and I was at a conference a little while ago, an M enabling conference, and Nan Bosler, who's the head of the seniors um, senior computer users club. It's, yeah, we have one in Australia, a bunch of seniors who get together, use computers. <laughs> and um, basically she said to us, everybody who is sitting in the room, if you do not make your designs simple and intuitive and easy to use, then Australian seniors, or seniors in general, will not use them. This is a serious emerging market, I can't stress it enough. Keep it in mind. But it's not just people with disabilities, it's not just people who are older. Mobile, by definition, is actually disabling. Poor lights, small keyboards, glare, touch. So think about a time when you've gone outside in the sun and tried to look at your mobile phone. You become visually impaired and can't see what's going on. Um, and think of your little tiny touch keyboards, um, you know, using your sausage fingers to get that in. Now, I don't, I don't have sausage fingers. And even though... Sorry. <laughs> oh, you have sausage I didn't. pizza. <laughs> Um, no, no, I, I have small fingers, but my typing on my little keyboard is still seriously error prone. And I know that there are people who have larger hands and that it's even worse for them. Um, and it also, we can have temporary disabilities. So think about a time where you, something might have happened to you and you actually can't use one of your hands. That got quite personal for me earlier this year when I fell off my bike and I couldn't actually use my right hand to do anything. So I turned to the, I possess an HTC. Um, I turned to the speech to text function to do all of my texting and stuff like that. It was pretty crappy. I had to use an American accent to get some of the words recognized. <laughs> but it was still available to me as an option to help me through this temporary disability. Um, okay, so everybody's seen this, right? <laughs> Luke, Luke Roblowski in his Hindu cow pose amongst 73 devices. Um, touch technology is incredibly fractured, it is incredibly diverse, um, and our human capabilities are the same, they're not changing, so we don't need to just you know, accept it, we need to embrace that in all of the design ideas that we take forward. 
So my point about this is that... It's an Optimus. What, this one? On Brad Frost? Yes. Yeah, well that's got 73 devices and I'm sure there's more now. Um, the focusing on inclusion of people is the point that I really want to make. Because even if you try and design for all of these operating systems, which is an old picture, as you say, Jake, yep. you're still going to be designing for different operating systems and designing for mobile diversity and not actually for inclusion and not actually for people. Um, designing for the human capabilities is what we want to be doing, not designing for the device. Um, okay, so that's thing number two. Done. So I mean, I, I, sorry, not designing for the device. Mm -hmm. I think we can for both. Yep, we'll get to that. This is thing three. Okay, so thing number three um, is... I'm starting to sound like Dr. Seuss, aren't I? It's all right. Okay, so this is one of my favourite tweets. This is from about, actually back in 2011. This is Stephen Hay. Um, he's a Netherlands UXer and he tweeted, there is no mobile web, there is only the web, which we view in different ways. There is also no desktop web or tablet web. Thank you. Now, I actually really agree with this. I think this is very, very fundamental and very, very true. Basically, what he means is we're just adjusting the presentation of content or pieces of content. Um, that doesn't mean that you're constituting a mobile website. You're just creating a website which all of the developers and designers have considered the users of mobile devices and they've adjusted the certain things accordingly. Um, and so that's sounds pretty responsive to me. I don't know if that sounds responsive to you. Um, but my point of view, because I think Stephen is right, is that responsive design is the number one way that you can create an inclusive and universal touch experience. Um, because more and more mobile luminaries, so people like Josh Clark are saying we have to move away from this app mentality. And the well-executed responsive design should solve a lot of challenges because if a website's already inclusive via the desktop, then it's most likely to be touch friendly as well. If you think about just what we were looking at on the UCID side where they had the, um, the roles for things. Now, when you get onto um, a mobile device, so using voiceover, the rotor that um, Jason had up there can be looking for those roles. So if you've done that for your desktop site, then it's going to work when you turn on, you know, when you pick up a, an iOS device and Theoretically, Android, but... <laughs> it can be done. <laughs> it can be done. It can be done. Um, and also things like if you've used the right text alternative for alt text, so you were talking about images as well, making sure that if you put a text alternative that says that this is a decorative image that um, provides this information, that will flow on through to the um, text-to-speech functionality in any touch device. So I think that responsive design is actually the very definition of flexible in use. And for the rest of these, I've just put a little, you know, which of the universal design principles it's hitting. So flexibility, absolutely. Because the design adapts to the uncertainty of where and how and what device it's being used in. Um, because now we're designing from the content outwards, not from, I know this is really Yoda, not from the screen edge inwards. So if you think about traditional web design, we had you know, n number of pixels that we were designing for and we fit the content in there in our wireframes. And now what we've got is we have a whole heap of content that depending on the viewport or the presentation that it's, it's in, we have to show or not show or use a different interaction for people to be able to get at it. I'm hoping that that makes sense because it is, it is a little yoga. You can ask me questions about it. All right, so thinking about text-to-speech, so for example, an app or a site is not a book. People understand it's an e-book, but if it's just an app or a website, people are coming there to listen to enough information to orientate themselves, figure out what they can do, and then move on to the next thing. Um, and the rotor that Jason showed you, you saw that it can be looking for links, it can be looking for characters, it can be looking for form fields, it can be looking for um, bodies of text. So the way that you construct your design, you need to take that kind of thing into, into, <coughs> into account. Um, and the other thing is that text-to-speech is not just for people who are visually impaired. Voiceover does not equal blind. People who have dyslexia are also um, really fond of using uh, text-to-speech to consume digital content and I think it's about 10% of Australians who are dyslexic um, so we find this technology useful 
Um, so let's talk about practical design decisions that we can make. So designing with text-to-speech in mind, there's a lot of buttons and things that are used to get around applications. And it can get a little bit complex on touch devices, but complex doesn't have to, have to equal confusing if you use really good labeling. Um, so guiding people around, you can, you can do that with great success as long as your labels are sensible. Um, there are a couple of examples of this, um, and these are actually from the Apple iOS guidelines, which are a little out of date now, but you know, something is better than nothing. Um, don't actually be bossy. So when you are labeling a button, use a plural verb, such as deletes the event, not delete the event. Deletes the event says what the button is going to do. Delete the event sounds like it's telling you what to do. It's a really, really tiny thing, but it makes a big difference. Um, and you don't need to double up as well. For God's sake, label your buttons, because otherwise when voiceover or it talk back reads it out, it just goes button, which is not so helpful when you can't see what's going on. Um, but you don't need to label something an OK button, because then voiceover or talk back will read out OK button button, which is really irritating. Tiny things that you can do, but really, really easy. And make sure that there's more than one way to do things. So, for example, when you're designing for people with sensory impairments, um, a blinking light for a calendar alert is no good for somebody who can't see. An auditory alert is no good for somebody who can't hear. Um, use the device capabilities that you've got, such as you know haptics. The you know, de device has got loads of ways of telling people how that something's happening. And the vibration is something that most people can actually get um, an alert from. Um, and also, don't have just the one way of achieving a task. Um, my example for this is, uh, I think, PayPal app. Uh, you can use bump to transfer money, but if you can't grip your phone, you can't bump it against somebody else's phone competently. So PayPal has got the option of using bump, but they've also got the option of just doing it via tap as well, and basic touch interface, <coughs> and nobody is excluded. Mobile video, please make sure that it's captioned because there's a lot of video available and it's one of the most commonly consumed um, types of content. And people who are deaf or hearing impaired, they, they want to watch and listen to video as much as anybody else would. Um, and most, uh, most video is not captioned. Um, if you want to see an example of it done really well uh, with closed captions, there's the ones that you turn on, not open captions, which are on all the time. Um, ABC iView has got really good closed captions on its iPad app, so go and have a look at that for an example of how to do it well. Um, supporting dexterity challenges is around making touch targets that are big enough for people who might have a palsy in their hand. So I think Apple designates 40 pixels by 40 pixels as a totally acceptable size for something. What was that then? 44, 44 by 44. Yeah, that extra four pixels on its side makes a big difference. <laughs> um, and if you think about, you know, you've got a palsy in your hand and it shakes a little bit when you do stuff, 44 by 44 is pretty damn small. Um, this is where I give the Windows guys a little bit of an ups, not much, but a bit. Um, yay, Windows Phone. <laughs> but the, the big live tile, um, interface is really good for people who have dexterity challenges. They don't have an inbuilt uh, like, um, screen reader and they don't get in trouble real soon, but they've got really good dexterity. Um, allowing tolerance to error is also, I talked about that a little bit earlier, and using alternative methods to input information. Explain your device capabilities. So for example, instead of making people fill in a form to have their shopping delivered to you, maybe see if you can use the GPS for where the person's sitting and go, send it here. So just thinking about that kind of thing. Similar to the way that Uber works. So you can either pick up on GPS and it pins you, or you can adjust the pin to have a little bit more granularity if it doesn't get it right. But what I'm saying is just think about these kinds of things. Cookies. Cookies. Cookies for Mr. Litton, thank you. It's all right. um, it's <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just looking at time and I really need to get Sorry. through this. Um, so choosing small de uh, smart defaults is really important because the less choices that you ask somebody to make, the less movements they have to make them. This will help somebody who has got um, motor impairment, but it also helps people with cognitive impairment as well. Um, and remember the choices that people have made before, cookies. 
and which is also another way of helping people um, not have to do things over and over again. And the last piece of practical advice I want to leave you with is test, test, test. Because if you have a smartphone, you have a screen reader, and test your designs, you've got no excuse. Um, there is, just go to Google and put a very quick Google will give you the information that you need to turn on the accessibility settings on your phone. Um, Talkback and Ideal Browser works best on Android, but it's a very fractured landscape and difficult. Um, obviously, VoiceOver for Apple um, is what you would use. And Microsoft, good luck. Um, <laughs> okay, so I wanted to give you um, very last thing I wanted to do. No, this is still in three. Sorry, um, I wanted to show you my pick for a really great example of an inclusive and universal design app. This is the Open My Tours app, which replaces a museum or gallery audio device, or the, the audio guide, with a smartphone app, leveraging existing technology. So they went out to the hearing impaired community and said, what's your biggest problem? And they said, going to galleries and museums because we can't get that extra information that you always get through the audio device. So the ACE, Australian Communications Exchange, went and built this that delivers audio, audio captions, audio description for people who are blind, Auslan, so Australian Sign Language, and foreign languages as well. Okay, so this is the beta. I, I can show you screenshots of the beta. The beta's not out yet. Okay, so you download the, the app, open the, open the app and download your content by going to the venue that you're visiting. You then go into scan mode. So this is using the device camera and then you walk around the, um, the museum or the gallery and when the image, uh, when the scan recognises an image and puts up a little play button, you can press play on that. Um, it then will load the content about the, the picture that's in front of you. So in this instance, it was the Monet exhibition. And the content's then played in the format that you've selected. So this individual had selected Auslan um, and captions. Um, this is my pick because it benefits one in six Australians who have some level of hearing loss. The 1.2 million Australians who are blind or have a visual impairment. It benefits international tourists, people for whom English is a second language. It benefits children because captions actually are proven to improve literacy. Um, actually, it benefits all vis visitors, which is why it is my pick for a universal design app. Oh. Okay. Um, and thing four, all right, thing four, um, which is the future for touch. And the future for touch is actually, um, some of it is around haptics. Apple's actually put up a multiple motor patent. So what's haptics? Haptics. Okay, so haptics is actually tactile feedback when you do something to a device. So you press something and it goes it, um, and it vibrates or something. Yeah. Um, so what's, what Apple's done is a multiple motor patient that they've put in. This is something that they can put into their devices. So you can actually pinpoint a point on the screen that will feed back to you, just one little section of the screen. So you could have something that feels like a button or feeds back like a button. I don't know what they're going to do with it yet, but they think it was worthy enough to patent it. Um, the other thing is the tactus technology disappearing buttons. Basically, uh, this is where you've got buttons that appear and disappear when you touch them. So they've got multi-levels of plastic and it fills with a little fluid and the buttons come up, and then when you're not using, they go down again. Like, similar to refreshable braille, but you can kind of program them to do whatever it is. Now, Tactus, unfortunately, is putting this into their own device. I wish so much that they are actually working with other device manufacturers. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. It's, it's really cool technology. And the future actually might not be touch at all. Who's heard of Mayo? Yeah. Okay, so the gestural, the wristband that actually um, interprets gestures from your arm so that you can control a computer or a device or something like that. Now, Maya has not been, not been uh, put out there, but it's already sold 30,000 of these in pre-orders. The, the demand and the interest is so high. Um, the other one is Leap Motion. This is the one which you can put it down here and it tracks all 10 of your digits at 290 frames Per second. Still not good. And, but it's still not good according to Mark. Talk to Mark and he will tell you why leap motion is not good. Um, but I can't do that right now. Um, I think that's actually really fast and quite clever. 
it's got its limited scope. We'll debate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, but the future actually might be completely screenless. So if you think about Google Glass, you don't touch anything. And you've got your functions off your voice telling you stuff. And Google's already moving really rapidly to enable voice commands on all of its products, it's like Chrome. Um, the new Moto X phone has got a specialised chip in it. And the phone listens the whole time, even when it's asleep. And all you have to do to wake it up is to say the magic word, OK and it'll start listening to you and then doing whatever it is that you instruct it. Um, but I think that that's just part of the natural progression. If you think about 10 years ago, we sat down at our computers to write emails. Uh, five years ago, we pulled out our phones to start typing our emails on the phones. Um, and now we might just start speaking. Um, so, to sum up, universal design benefits everybody. And the mobile landscape is incredibly diverse and complex to navigate. This is hard stuff that I'm telling you about. Um, but if you stay focused on inclusion and mobile, not mobile diversity, then you stand a chance of actually designing something that is for human beings. Um, the future of our touch devices is awesomely uncertain. I would say get really excited because you don't know what the next thing around the corner is going to be. And I think whatever it is is probably going to be awesome. So thank you very much.